All right, so today we're going to be actually starting Ezekiel. Ooh. So Ezekiel is one of the books that, that is not really known to most of the people. They heard about Ezekiel, but not many people really heard about Ezekiel or know uh, the contents of the Ezekiel. So let me ask you this. So how much do you know about the book of Ezekiel? Do you know anything about Ezekiel? Or, or you have a, a good understanding of Ezekiel? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. So Ezekiel is, um, it's a well-known book, but most people don't know exactly what's in Ezekiel. They never learned about what's in Ezekiel. And uh, so the kind of impression for most of people, Ezekiel is a thick book. And it's very hard to understand. And even if they read the the Ezekiel, they don't really understand exactly what Ezekiel um, book is about. So we're going to uh, deep dive into uh, the book of Ezekiel. And there are lots of uh, good contents in here. Some are complicated. Some are easy. You know, depending on you know the, the, your understanding of the Bible. The more you understand the Old Testament, the better you can understand. But if you don't have any understanding of the previous books of the Old Testament, it's going to be very difficult for you to understand exactly what God is actually um, prophesizing through Ezekiel. Um, there are a couple of things that I want you guys to understand about the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a kind of sad book. It's a very, very sad book. And... Uh, this this is one of the book that God actually poured out, and uh, he explains how how much he was um, hurted by the Israel, and um, he explains why he had to do what he had to do. So it's like this: you have a misbehaving children, and you have to discipline your child. Um, and you are trying to explain to your sons why you have to, you know, you have to explain. But when you try to discipline your, your child, obviously your child does not know what the child is doing. That's why you are trying to discipline. And you're trying to explain to your child, this is why I, I have to discipline you or why I have to ground you. But... They will not going to understand. So this is a kind of book that you can think of like that. You know, as if God is actually speaking to Israel why he had to do what he had to do. And why he had to actually discipline Israel and Judah. So there's a lot of uh, uh, the story that God is actually explaining to Ezekiel and uh, Judah you know, how much he was hurted. And even if he, he's disciplining the Judah, you know, it's it's not something that he's, uh, he's um, happy to do so. It is something that he doesn't want to do, but he had to do. So there are a few things we have to learn about Ezekiel. So Ezekiel, um, <clears throat> Ezekiel is the... Um, He's a son of the, the priest, so he's supposed to be a priest, but he became a prophet. There are a few people in the, old, you know, in, the, in the Bible that the person is the descendants of the priest, so they're supposed to be a priest, but instead of becoming a priest, became a prophet, and uh, Ezekiel is one of them. Jeremiah was also um, a son of the uh, um, the priest, but he also became a, a prophet as well. So Ezekiel. So let's just understand um, his name <coughs> better. Ezekiel is actually made out of two words in Hebrew. One is um, um, uh, uh, hazak, hazak, uh, l. So hazak is a one word, 
El is another word. So what Hazak means is Hazak means strength. And El, as you know, it is God or the Lord, right? So there is exactly the same name that we can reference um, in other parts of the uh, Bible. Do you can you remember any of the a person that you know in the Bible has exactly the same name? Can you think of anyone that you can um, come up with? There is a <clears throat> one person in the Bible that has exactly the same name in the Bible. Who would that be? Yeah. So it's a kind of a difficult, <laughs> difficult uh, things for most people to really just um, uh, to guess or uh, know. So Ezekiel is almost the same exact name as Hezekiah. You remember the Hezekiah? Hezekiah is the one who actually just uh, um, devoted himself and then started the... Um, uh, all the feast of the God and following the uh, the Moses law, Hezekiah is exactly the same name. It's um, Hazak. It's the same thing. The difference between Ezekiel versus Hezekiah is Hezekiah has Hazak plus Yah, which means Yahweh, and Ezekiel has Hazak plus El. So. Only difference is Hezekiah has Hazak and Yah, and Ezekiel has a Hazak plus El. So the difference between Yahweh and El is one is God, the other one is Lord. So it's the same thing. The God is my strength. Is That's what it means. So Ezekiel means the Lord is my strength. That's what the, uh, the Ezekiel name means. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> with the basic understanding of his name and the, um, the contents of the Ezekiel, let's read the chapter 1. In the uh, 30th, 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Kebar Canal, the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of a king, Jehoiachin. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Butsi, in the land of Chardians by the Kebar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So, here's uh, things that we need to think about. The, Eze the Ezekiel starts with, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, among the, uh, on the fifth day of the month. So, the question is, in the 30th year, what 30th year? 30th year from what? And there's a lot of questions in what that really 30th year means. And we don't know exactly what this 30th year that Ezekiel is referencing, but many of the, the scholars um, kind of guess that this could be his age. Nobody knows exactly what that 30th means, but many of the scholars believe that this is referencing his, his age. He's, he's reaching the 30th years and he, uh, on the month, uh, the fourth month and the fifth day. So it looked like he's, uh, he just, uh, he's just recently reached the 30th year. Some other scholar also referenced that this could be the, the years from the time when, um, the, uh, What's his name? Um, one second. <coughs> um, uh, 
Let's see. Yeah, some people believe that this is the the thirtieth year from from the time when uh, Josiah uh, started um, the uh, restore the um, the gods uh, the law, or the uh, he revamped um, the. Judah to really worship the Lord, um, but there's no evidence that this thirtieth year is referencing from the time when Josiah started to revamp the uh, the law of Judah. So many scholars uh, suspect that this could be the, his age, or could be the other way. But there is no specific reasons to believe one or the other. Uh, but it's just a common understanding. Many of the, uh, when you read um, some other books, you may actually, you know, people referencing that he's, this could be his age. So it is not really important, but it's just a, something that I want just to point this out. All right. So in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, and then I was among the exile by the Kebar Canal. The heavens were open, and I saw a vision of God on the fifth day of the month, which is the one month later. It was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Butzi, in the land of Achardian by the Kebar canals, and the hand, uh, hand of the Lord was upon him there. So, we can... We can kind of like, you know, figure it out exactly what year this is. Because he does mention, he says, this is the fifth year of the exile of a King Jehoiachin. So when Jehoiachin was dragged into um, Babylon is B.C. 597. So five years after Jehoiachin was brought to Babylon, so this year that Ezekiel had a vision was B.C. 592. So we can kind of like figure it out exactly what year that Ezekiel had this vision based on what he recorded in this book. As I looked... Behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud, and with brightness around it, the fire flashing forth uh, continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming uh, metal, and from the midst of it came the likeness of a four living creature, and this was their appearance that they they had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of the kelp foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had a human hands, and the four had their faces, and their wings, though, their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had a face of a lion on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each cre uh, cre uh, creature had two wings, each of which touched the wings of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward whenever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creature, 
their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creature, and the fire was bright. And one of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of the flashing of lightning. So, this is the first time ever in the Bible that describes the really detailed descriptions of what the this four living creature、uh, is about. So, what is this four living creature? Do you know what this is? I ask questions. This four living creature is cherub. This is cherub. When did the cherub appear in the Bible? Where do we see cherub appeared in the Bible for the first time? In Genesis. In Genesis. Where in the Genesis? All right. Let's just turn to a Genesis. <clears throat> We're gonna turn to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three. All right, we're going to turn to Genesis chapter three, verse twenty-two and on. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, "Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil." Now, lest us reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, and living for ever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from the which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, cherubim is the one who guarded the the Garden of Eden with the flaming sword. Now, cherubim, okay, in Hebrew word that ends with im is plural forms of、um, the.、Uh, it's a male plural form. So cherub is the singular form. Cherubim means actually plural form of cherub. So this is where the cherub appear in the Bible for the very first time. A cherub appear in the Genesis chapter chapter three, but there is no explanation as to like what this cherubim is about, and we have no idea when this. Creature was created, or what it does. There's no explanation whatsoever. However, this cherubim appeared in the Old Testament multiple times, but most of the people have no knowledge of this cherubim because there's no detailed descriptions or the explanation is about cherubim, or even when you think about. We always hear the words "angel." We we see angel appear in the Bible all the time, but we have no idea what the angel looks like, or what the angels do when they were created. We have a zero information. There's no explanation of exactly when they were created, what they do, what they look like. But we know the angel because the angel appeared in the Bible many many places. So what most people think it is, angel and the cherub is the same thing. They're not the same. 
They're two different spiritual beings. They're not the same. Angel is not cherub. Cherub is not angel whatsoever. They're a completely different spiritual being. Why they're different? What they do different? We don't know exactly how different they are, but there's a, some clue that left in the Bible exactly what the, uh, uh, the cherub or cherubims do. So, let's coming back to Ezekiel again. So let's take a look at uh, this particular four creature. So, have you actually seen the word a cherub coming out of this context? Did the Bible mention anywhere this four creature is the cherub? Okay, so how do we know this cherub, uh, this four creature, is the cherub? Well, obviously, we cannot tell, right? In order for us to understand this four creature is the cherub, we need to actually understand from different parts of the Bible. So this time... I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10. We're going to read from verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on the expense that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above then something like a sapphire. In appearance like the throne, and he said to the man clothed in linen, going among the whir uh, whirling wheels underneath the cherubim, fill your hands with burning coals from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in before my eyes. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house. When the man went in and cloud uh, the filled, the inner cord, and the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshing uh, uh, threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was the heard as far as the outer cord, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And when he commanded the man clothed in linen, take fire from between the whirling wheel, from between the cherubim. He went in and stood beside a wheel, and the cherub stretched out his hand from between the cherubim to the fire that was be between the cherubim, and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen, who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a human hand under their wings. And I looked, and behold, there were four will besides the cherubim, one besides each cherub. And the appearance of the will was like the sparkling burl. And as for their appearance, the four had the same likeness as if a will were within the will. When they went, they went in any of their four directions with turning as they went, but in what uh, whatever directions the four uh, front wheel faced, the other follow without turning as they went. And their whole body, their rims, and their spokes, their wings, and the wheels were filled with eyes all around, and wheels that the four of them had. And as for the wheels, they were called in my hearing, the whirling wheel, and every one had four faces. The, four, the first face was the face of the chirp, and the second face was the human face, and the third, the face of a lion, and the fourth, uh, the face of an eagle. Which is exactly the same as the one that we just read in the chapter 1 of Ezekiel. So that's how we know the one that Ezekiel was describing in the chapter 1 is cherub, because of the chapter 10. So, cherub is called two different ways. One is either cherub or cherubim. Second is called the four creature. So whenever you reference the four creature or the cherub or the cherubim, we know 
the Bible is referencing specifically about the cherub. Uh, in the Bible, there is a two very similar um, the uh, characteristic or, or the spiritual being that has a very similar char uh, characteristic. Uh, But they're a little bit different. But they're similar, but they're different. So how is it different? When you actually go to Isaiah chapter 6, which we cover a long time ago. When you go to Isaiah chapter 6. <clears throat> Isaiah saw another vision. What Isaiah saw in chapter 6 is, when you go to uh, chapter 6 of Isaiah, let's take a look at the um, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 and on. In the year of a king, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord is sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And a train of his robe filled the temple. Above, above him stood the seraphim. Each had the six wings. With two he covered his face. And two covered uh, his feet. And two he flew. And he called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. So, what we see in this chapter, we hear about the, the look of the seraphim. So, seraph, theme, as I mentioned, that ends with im in Hebrew words, is male plural form. So, cherub, cherubim. Seraph, seraphim. So they are just the plural form. There are two similar spiritual beings, but they're different. The difference between seraph and cherub, almost the same, almost the same. But the difference we can see here is that cherub has four wings. Seraph has a six wings. So there is a difference between seraph and cherub. However, even with this particular descriptions of seraph, there is no further descriptions what the seraph looks like. But in Ezekiel, Ezekiel described a very detail of what the cherub looks like. When you think about the, the descriptions of a cherub, it looked like a monster. It doesn't look like something that you like something that you actually just like pleasantly look at it and, and, and you please with. It it's just like look like a, a monster. But that's what he saw. So when you hear the cherub, you can think of what the cherub looks like based on Ezekiel. Um so, one thing that you need to keep in mind, many of the people believe um, Satan became, no, the fallen angel became Lucifer, which is a Satan. Many of the many of the people believe it, it is fallen angel is the Satan or the evil. But that's not true. Because that's how most people say it, but that's not how the Bible describes. So Let's take a look at um, uh, 
Um, let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to read from verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre. Say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you are the signet of perfections, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamonds, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and uh, carbuncle. And the crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You are an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire. You walked, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your minds and you sinned. So I cast you as profane things from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stone of fire. So, Bible explains, especially Ezekiel, described a lot of details that we didn't know before. That God created cherub and cherubims. And one of the cherub became righteous. And because he trusted his own beauty and wisdom, he wanted to lift himself above God's throne. He wanted to become God himself. And because of his unrighteousness, God destroyed him and threw him out. So, God created cherub and the cherub became Satan. So, you may actually hear many kids or even adults asking these questions. Why did God create a Satan or evil? This is the very common questions that a lot of people ask. If God did not create a Satan or the, cher, um, the, uh, the evil, we would not have to suffer. We would not have to actually suffer from this uh, sins. Right? So, with that, did God create a Satan or evil? No, God did not create a Satan or evil at all. What did God create? It? God created a cherub. And cherub became prideful and he wanted to become a god himself and then he was the fallen cherub instead of fallen angel because as I mentioned cherub and the angels are two different spiritual beings they're not the same based on what we see in the Bible it seems like cherub is above angel so there is a there's a, some sort of like hierarchy in the spiritual being as well. It seems like the angel and above angel, there is a archangel, which is the, like um, Michael. Michael is archangel, right? So there is an angel and there's archangel and cherub and seraphims are above the archangel. That's why even Michael was archangel he cannot compete against the, the cherub. Even Michael, even though he's the archangel, he could not speak boldly to Satan because he used to be cherub. Because above the cherub was above the archangel. How do we know this? So let's turn to uh, Jude in the New Testament. Right before Revelation.
Revelations chapter, obviously uh, Jude does not have multiple chapters, there's only one chapter. So Jude, we're going to read from verse 5. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who died, uh, who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept an eternal chain under the gloomy darkness under the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in like manner, these people also rely on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blasphemy the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contempting with the devil, was disputing about body of Moses, he did not presume to uh, pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, Lord, rebuke, rebuke you, but these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. They are destroyed by all that they, like under, unreasoning animals, understanding in, intrinsically. Uh, so even Archangel Michael speaking to this evil one, or Satan, but he could not really rebuke the Satan, because he used to be cherub before, which was above him. So what he can say is, since he could not directly rebuke the, uh, the Satan, which he used to be the cherub, he's saying, I want the Lord to rebuke you. I can rebuke you, but I want the Lord to rebuke you, because the God is above everything. So it seems like there is a hierarchy in the spiritual being, why there is the, uh, the hierarchy in the spiritual being, I do not know. But based on the, some of the descriptions th that we can see in the Bible, it seems like there is some hierarchy. So angel, archangel, cherub, and seraph. We don't know what the difference between the seraph and a cherubim. It is one thing we do know. Whenever we hear cherub or uh, the seraph, they're always around the God's throne. They're close to the God's throne. So whenever you hear the cherub or the seraph, you always, always see the God's throne is there. So we can tell, based on some of the descriptions that we see, it is a guardian. Cherub is a guardian. Guardian is actually, it's like a guardian of God. So they're always around the God's throne. So they're close to the God, then angel or the archangel. That's the only thing that we can see. So there's a here, there's a pieces pieces of information here, there. We just you know collect them together to understand exactly what this is about. So based on that, whenever you actually hear the cherub or cherubim. There's another word, or the, they're called to be four creature. So the, here's the question. Since the God mentioned, or the scripture mentioned, four creatures. So, does this mean there's only four cherub? Or there may be five cherub God created, and one fell, became a Satan, or the evil one. So now it is a remaining of a four cherubs because the one became Satan. Or God created a four and then one, be one became a Satan or the evil. So now only three remaining. We don't know. Why God is actually calling the four creature, whether there's only four or more, we don't know. But cherub is always a reference as either cherub or cherubim. Or four creatures. So whenever you hear the four creature, you will hear the cherub. There's one exception. 
there seems to be Serap, Cherub, and there's another spiritual being. We have no idea what this is, but there's something that we hear in the Bible, but we don't know what this is because there's no name. So let's take a look at the um, that particular uh, creature in the in the scripture. So let's go to Revelation chapter four. Revelations chapter four. We're going to read from verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and uh, carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the throne were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crown on their heads. From the throne came flesh of lightnings and rumbling and uh, peals of thunders, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirit of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The four, uh, the first, the living creature like a lion; the second, living creature like an ox; and third, the living creature with the face of a man and fourth living creature like an eagle in flight and the four living creatures each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within and day and night they never cease to say holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come and whenever the living creature gave, uh, give the glory and honor and thank to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And twenty-four elders fell down before him who is seated on the throne and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crown before the throne, saying, Word, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you, uh, created all things, and by your will they s exist and were created. So based on this, the revelations, around the throne, there is a living creatures that we see. But when you look at the descriptions of this spiritual being, there are multiple different kind of a spiritual beings. So there, there are 24 elders, and there are seven spirits. So there are Different kinds of living creature. We don't know exactly who they are, what they do. There's no further descriptions of exactly who they are. However, there's one thing that we can identify from here. One is, there is a living creature. There are four living creatures. So, when we hear the four living creature, what do we think of? We think of cherubim, right? Four living creatures supposed to be cherubim. But the four living creatures that we see in the Revelation is a slightly different than the one that we hear from Isaiah. Why? I don't know why. However, the descriptions that Re uh, the John is giving, is a, there is a little bit different. So when you look at the descriptions, it has the image of a cherub, but it has the six wings. Cherub supposed to have a four wings instead of six wings. Serap has the six wings and Cherub has the four wings. But this living creature, whatever this is, has the mixture of both Serap and Cherub together combined. So there is a two, it, this, whatever this four creatures that John is talking about has the mixture and it's just like combination of both Serap and Cherub together. Because Serap has, we don't know what the Serap face looks like but the faces that describes on this 
Revelation has the same image of cherub. All right? And it's got the eyes on the wings. But it says, They never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This is what the seraph was actually praising about the Lord. So, whatever this is, there is no specific name to it, but it seems like it has both characteristic of seraph as well as cherub. I, I, we don't know what this is, but there is a definitely a different kind of a spiritual being that we actually see in the Bible. But at least in the Old Testament, there is a two separate uh, spiritual being, seraph as well as cherub. So, what we're learning about um, this spiritual being in Ezekiel is cherub, which I mentioned the first time ever this cherub has appeared in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3. And seraph, we only seen this particular spiritual being in Isaiah. That's it. There's no other places that mention about seraph. However, cherub appears in the Bible, you know, many places. If you ever learn about tabernacle when you actually go into the holy of a holy place there is um the covenant in the holy of a holy place and above the uh the covenant there's the cover on the cover there's a two image on the cover that is the cherub they're actually spread their wings and touching the wings together. So let's take a look at that particular scene. So let's go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 25. We're going to read from verse 10. They shall make an ark of acacia wood, two cubits and a half it shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside, it shall, be, uh, shall you overlay it. And you shall make, uh, make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast a four rings of gold for it. And put them on its four feet, two rings on one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings of those sides of the ark to carry the ark, of, uh, ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark of the testimony that I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat of a pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammer to work. That shall you make them on two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall be uh, shall you, like the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces one to another towards the mercy seat shall be the face of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. The Ark of Covenant, which is in the old, uh, the holy of a holy place. So, when you put this Ark of Covenant, and there's a cover on it, so the cover actually has cherub on one side and the other cherubs on the other side, and they are spreading their wings and touching each other. So. Moses ordered them to create this Ark of Covenant and put a cover and there's an image of cherub. Unfortunately, in 
Exodus or any other parts of the Bible describe what that cherub image looks like. So we cannot tell what image they created on, on this Ark of Covenant, but Moses has seen the image that God has shown him because Moses actually built this tabernacle based on what he saw up on the mountain. So God had shown him the image of the tabernacle with everything what is supposed to be built. So Moses must have explained to the the, the people who are building this Ark of Covenant, and they say, I want you to build this image of cherub this way. Unfortunately, Moses does not, did not describe the, the specific image of the cherub itself. But what we do know, they created the image of the cherub on top of the mercy seat, which is the cover of the Ark of Covenant. So that we know the cherub appears everywhere in Old Testament. So, we kind of have an idea what the cherub looks like based on the, the descriptions that we see in the book of Ezekiel. So Ezekiel described what the cherub looks like. And as I mentioned, when you read of it, it, it almost has an image of the monster that we can think of. All right. But there's a couple of questions. Wait a second. If the cherub is spiritual being how would this spiritual being has image like for example we have a spirit we have a soul but does it have an image does a spirit has image does a soul has image obviously it does not have image we have an image because we have a flesh, right? We have a flesh, what you see on the screens. I can see you, right? That's the image of you. However, souls and a spirit is in me, but I cannot see the image of your spirit. But somehow, this cherub, even though this is a spiritual being, it has an image. That's kind of strange. Because it describes the image of that spiritual being. How about this one? Is angel spiritual being? Angel is a spiritual being as well. What is the image of angel? Have you seen the image of angel? Does the image of an angel is a little infant with the little white wings and you know fly over the air? Is that what the image of a angel? That's pretty much the what's the most people think of an angel in their head, right? When you, whenever most of people think of an angel, they think of a, like a baby with a little bit of a white wings. Right? That's what most people think of an angel. But that's their imagination. But according to the scriptures, angel never appear that way. Bible never described the angels the way we imagine of an angel. So what is the actually the Bible describes an angel like? Whenever you actually see the appearance of an angel we see the, the image of angel as if there is a grown young man or adults. They appear like a man. That's why in the, all the en entire Bible, including Old Testament and New Testament, whenever they appear, they appear like a man. So for example, when Jesus died and buried, right, inside of the stone tomb. When Mary and his disciples came over to the tomb to look for Jesus' body, what did they see? They saw two angels wearing a white linen, right? They met two angels, but those two angels did not 
appeared as the baby with the the white wings, you know, and with the hollows behind it. No, there's nothing like that. They saw two men at the tomb. So everywhere in the Bible that appeared, angel also has image that appeared in the Bible that most people have seen them. So it seems like angel has a, some form of image as well. But we cannot see. But according to the scripture, many of the people have met the angels. Remember, every time when we celebrate the Christmas, right? Mary had met the angel. Angel gave the instructions to Mary that she will bear a child and named him Jesus and call him Emmanuel. Right? This angels that Mary had met Right? It's not like Mary only heard a voice. She met the angel. Shepherd met the angel. Because the angel told the shepherd, there is the king of Israel has born. So the shepherd actually went to the place where Jesus was born and greeted. Right? So the shepherd had met the angel as well. Once again, those angels that they had met did not have a baby with the white wings or the hollows behind their head. Nothing like that. They were just appeared as just a man. So that we can see even other spiritual being that we know also has a, some sort of image. How do they have an image and why do they have an image? I do not know. But appeared that they have an image. And cherub also has an image. That's why they built those cherubim at the corners of those, the mercy seat, above the mercy seat. So coming back to Ezekiel again, chapter 1, let's take a look at a few things here. Starting verse 4 again. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and great cloud and with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually in the midst of the fire. As it were gleaming metal, and from the midst of midst of it came the likeness of a four living creatures. And this was their appearance. So it actually described what he saw in the vision. They had a human likeness, but each had a four faces, and each of them had a four wings. So as I mentioned, Cherub has a four wings and four faces. Their legs were straight. And the soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf foot. So we can see they have the foot but look like a calf foot. And they sparkle like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four side they had a human hands. So they, they have a human hands. And the four had their faces, their wings though. Their wings touched the one another, each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went, as for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. So the four had the face of a lion, the right side, the four had the face of an ox, and on the le uh, left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. So what? Faces does cherub has human face, ox face, eagle face, and lion face. There are four faces, right? Now, once again, let's say one more time what's the face of a cherub? One with Human face, second, lion, third, ox, fourth, eagle. Do you remember that? Human and what? Lion, ox, eagle. So now you can remember those four faces, right? 
But there are strange things in the Bible. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 10 again. Ezekiel chapter 10. We're going to read verse 14. Pay attention. And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of the cherub. And the second face was a human face. And the third face of an lion. And the fourth face of an eagle. Wait a second. What faces does it have? It's, it has a human face, lion, an eagle. And what, what's the other face? Cherub. What is that face of that cherub that is mentioning? Ox. Right? It's an ox. So now, as I mentioned, Satan is one of those four creatures, which is cherub. And he became Satan, or the evil one, because of his own pride heart, and because he's of the beauty, because of his wisdom, he became a Satan. Right? Now, I want you to know this for a second. When Israel came out of Egypt, when they came out of Egypt, and when Moses went up to the Mount Sinai to receive the God's law at the mountain, he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. But unfortunately, the Israelites who were at the, uh, the bottom of the mountain did not know why is taking so long for him to just to come down? They have no idea what is happening at the top of the mountain, right? During that 40 days and 40 nights, when Moses was up on the top of the mountain, he was receiving the God's law, right? He received it, you know, 10 commitments, and he received the, uh, you know, it has seen the image of the tabernacles, and he also has seen those, you know, uh, the, the heard the message of God, you know, or about the, 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 the law of God, right? He spent 40 days and 40 nights. While he was receiving those messages from the Lord at the top of the mountain, Aaron and the rest of the Israelites, since they were waiting and waiting and days and weeks, Moses did not come down because it took more than a month, right? So many of the people believed that Moses dead. So let's take a look at that particular scenes. Let's go to um, Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods. Who shall go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? We do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to him, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with graving tools and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, of, O Israel, who brought you up out of the hand of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, 
Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offering and brought peace offering. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So while Israelites were waiting at the bottom of the mountain, and they were sure exactly what happened to Moses up on the mountain. So they thought, we don't know what happened to Moses. He might have actually died because we dare to go up there. Because if you go up there, God strikes us down. We're all going to die. So I'm, I'm not going to go up to the mountain. So if he died, he died. So now we have to find a way to just you know continue this journey without Moses. So Aaron said, hmm, you know what? I want you to just bring all the gold from your earrings that you're wearing. Either you, yourself, your wives, your daughters, your sons, whatever. You guys just bring all the ornaments to me. And they brought all the golds, the ornaments. And what Aaron told the people is, I want you to take all these ornaments, the golden ornaments, and then make an image of a kelv. So they made a golden kelv. And when they made a golden kelv, Aaron is the one who actually told Israelite and said, this is the God who brought us out of Egypt. Tomorrow, we're going to have a feast and we're going to really just, uh, you know, enjoy and give the burnt offering and peace offering to the Lord. And that's what they did. At the bottom of their mountain, they were having a, you know, like parties, literally. While Moses up in the mountain receiving God's law. And literally, and God told Moses, go down to the mountain because they have built an altar of gold. And Moses came down and saw what they were doing. He brought the two stone tablet. He threw it down to the ground and the, those stone tablet was scattered, right? And then what did Moses do? He literally destroyed that golden calf and grinded it. And had them eat that grind gold. God was furious and mad. So now, I want you to think about this one. Why did Israelite made a golden calf? Why not golden lion? Doesn't that look much cooler than an a ox or the calf? Lion looks much, you know, it makes more sense because a lion is the, you know, the king of the animals. Or right? like, well, why not make the, you know, the golden lion? They made a golden calf. So why did they make the golden calf, number one? And two, after they made a golden calf, what do they do with this golden calf? All the Israelites were gathered. They worshiped before this golden calf. So they bowed down before this golden calf and worshiped this golden calf. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Men are created in the image of God. Is that correct? When God created Adam, God created the image of God. So, human and man have the image of God. Right? We are created like likeness of God. We have the image of God. So then, if the, all the Israelites were gathered around this golden kelp and they bow down before this golden kelp, what does it look like? It's like God is bowing down to this golden kelp. Which means, what is the image of cherub? Ox. Ox. Golden kelp is literally the image of the Satan. The Satan is making the image of God, the man, to bow down before him. This almost appeared that God is bow down, bowing down to Satan. That's exactly what the Satan wanted it. 
That's how the four creature became a Satan because he wanted to be God. He wanted to put his throne above God's throne. He wanted to be above God. He wanted the God to bow down to him. And he made the Israelites to bowing down before the golden calf. Gold represent God in the Bible. That's why when you learn about tabernacle, when you enter into the holy place, inside the holy place, everything is made out of gold. Everything is made out of gold because that shows God's characteristic. So, they made a golden kelp means it's God. When King David died, David had a son. He had a many sons, of course, but he had a son who succeeded King David, which was a Solomon, right? And after Solomon died, which was a peaceful time, after Solomon died, his son succeeded Solomon. His name was Rehoboam. And there is another guy who used to work for Solomon, and he went up to the north side of Israel. He found the north of Israel, and Rehoboam took over the south side of the Israel. So after the Solomon's day, Israel now split it into north of Israel and south of Judah. Right? When you think of Israel, usually top of the Israel is Dan. And the bottom of the Israel is um, Beersheba. So always called Dan to Beersheba is what they actually describe it as Israel. But let's take a look at this. Let's go to um, First King First King Turn to Chapter Twelve. First King Chapter Twelve. We're going to read from verse twenty five and on. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the king will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifice in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then heart of the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your God, uh, behold, uh, behold your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set, on, uh, set one in Bethel and the other put in Dan. Then this thing became a sin, for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. 
He also made a temple on high places and appointed priests from among all the people who were not of the Levites. And Jeroboam appointed a feast of the fifteenth day of the eight, eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and he offered a sacrifice on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the kelv that he made. And placed in Bethel the priest of the high places that he had made. He went up to the altar that he made. He had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month that he had devised from his own heart, as he instituted a feast for the people of Israel and went up to the altar to make offering. What did this Jeroboam do when he started? The north of Israel, which is from where to where? From Dan to Bethel. That's where the borderline between the Israel and the south of Judah. So the top of the Israel is Dan, as I mentioned. And the bottom of the Israel is supposed to be Beersheba. But because the land is divided into two, northern side of the Israel and southern side of the Israel, the northern side of the Israel was ruled by Jeroboam, and south of Judah was ruled by the son of Solomon, Rehoboam. Now, when Jeroboam built the northern side of the Israel, only thing that he was concerned that because the Jerusalem is in the southern part of the Jerusalem, if people have to worship the Lord, they have to go to temple because there is only one temple in Jerusalem. So everybody, whether they live in the south or the north, they all have to go to temple to worship the Lord. So Jeroboam said, no, 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 no. If they actually go to south of Judah to worship the Lord, they, their heart may change that they actually, they may worship the Rehoboam and they're going to kill me. So, what I need to do is I have to make sure that people do not go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord or give any offering to the Lord in Jerusalem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make the, the golden kelv and going to place at the den and also place the golden kelv at the bottom of the Israel, which is the Bethel. Now, I'm going to ask you, what's the name of, what's the meaning of Bethel mean? Bethel. You mean house of God? Correct. Beth El, right? House of God. But in the house of God, what did Jeroboam do? He put the golden calf. So he made the, Jer the Jeroboam made the Israelites, the northern part of the Israel. Do not go outside of a Jerusalem, uh, outside of the northern, you know, Israel. So the, he placed it at the top of the Israel, at the bottom of Israel. So he placed the golden calf at the in a Dan, and he also placed the golden calf at the Bethel. Right now, people do not go to Jerusalem anymore. They started to worship the Lord. Jeroboam said. This golden calf is the one that deliver us out of Egypt. Just like the same Clement, same claim that the Aaron made. That's exactly what the Aaron said to the people. And they worshipped the golden calf at the time. At the desert. Right? And Jeroboam is doing the, exactly the same thing. So since then, people did not go to Jerusalem. So think about it for a moment. It's too much trouble for people to go to Jerusalem to worship. It's a golden calf is at the Dan as well as Bethel. So it's a convenient for people. They don't have to travel long to go to Jerusalem to worship and then come back. So they made it convenient for people. Right? For us, it's a convenient Whatever is convenient is what I like to do. I don't want to make too much trouble to go all the way down to the, you know, the Jerusalem to worship. It's good. I like it. I like it because it's close to my house. I don't want to have to travel all the way down to Jerusalem. It makes me easier 
to go and worship the Lord. That convenience made him fall. And because of the Jer Jeroboam, he deceived the people to worship the golden calf rather than worship the true Lord. And he is the one who destroyed the people. And people who follow the convenience because it's close to their house and I want to do it easy way to worship the Lord, they started to worship the golden calf. And going back to the same thing what I mentioned, what does the evil one want to do? He wants the people who has the image of God bow down before the golden calf. I am the God. God, you worship me. You bowing down before me. And that's exactly what the Satan wanted to do. So, think about this for a moment. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, a 24. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read verse 15. So Matthew chapter 24 is what Jesus told people what must happen at the end time. Okay? While he was describing what must take place at the end time, he actually mentioned this. Matthew chapter 24 verse 15 says this. So, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the people, a prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What did Daniel say? Let's go back to the Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, which is the book that we already studied Daniel chapter 9 we're going to read from verse 27 And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So, Daniel is talking about the Antichrist. And during the seven years, this Antichrist is going to make a promise with people, which he come as peace. He's coming like a sheep and making a promise. And during the seven years of promise that he made, and half of those seven years, and after the three and a half years, he's going to break that promise that he made, and he's going to show himself as Antichrist, as I describe it when we study the book of Daniel. What Daniel and Jesus saying in common is that when abominations stand in the holy place, you flee because now the judgment has arrived. Now, what is that abomination stand on the uh, holy place? Going back to what I said before. What did Jeroboam do? Jeroboam made a golden calf at Dan as well as Bethel. What, did, what does the Bethel mean? House of God. And he placed the golden calf at the Bethel. It's like abomination stand on the holy place, which is house of God. How could the golden calf could reside in Bethel? 
but he made the place golden calf at the Bethel, which is abomination in the holy place. That's exactly what the Antichrist will do. Which I mentioned, Antiochus the fourth did exactly what I described when I was going over the, the book of Daniel. So that kind of make exactly make sense of what I just described. Right? Now when you think of when you think of this. Have you ever been to Manhattan? Or even if you have never came to Manhattan, when you actually ever visit Manhattan, when you go to the bottom part of Manhattan, there is what you know as Wall Street. When you think of Wall Street, what comes to your mind money money that's where the, all the monies are made that's the financial district where all the monies are flowing in right that's where all the trades are done that where, where all the financial firms making money right now when you think about it when you actually go there you will see one famous very famous statue at Wall Street what is that do you know you don't know okay I'll sh what's that bulls right so I'm gonna show you At least you have seen this image, right? All right? Is there anyone who has seen this image of bull? Why? There is a bull in Wall Street. What does this bull represent in Wall Street? It's about money, wealth. This is where people make money. Money is draw our heart. People live for money. They can give up their fate for money. Money is the most critical part of our life. You know what? When financial crisis comes, we blame the government and president because you do not have the right way to manage the, our countries. Our, our financial markets are crashing. People blame the presidents and the government. Now, this is one thing we need to keep in mind. Money is drawing our heart. What is doing that? Look at this. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, twenty four. Matthew chapter six, twenty four. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
We claim, we claim, I can serve money and God at the same time. I can do that. But the scripture says, no, you cannot. Why? Because your heart will be drawn by money. You will go after money. Imagine if this option was a given to most of the church member. Listen, I'm going to give you an option. You can go either worship service on Sunday or you can come to me. I'll give you $10,000 for free. Where do you think people will go? <laughs> people go after $10,000. It's okay. I can skip the worship. No problem. You know, $10,000, I'll go. I'll, I'll pick up the $10,000 and then I'll go to church. <laughs> right? That's what people say. I'll, I'll pick up the $10,000, I'll skip the worship. And then if I can make it, I'll go to church after that. Right? <laughs> exactly. I worship I worship online and I'll go and pick up the ten thousand dollars, right? That's exactly what people will do. Who would go to worship service and, and lose ten thousand dollars? People will go for ten thousand dollars. They made something different in front of the people. Right? But in their heart, they will go after ten thousand dollars. They will go after money. That's our pure heart most people will go after money why this bull this ox calf represent wealth money and that's what draws people's attention that's what it draws our heart people go after this wealth and money then God because God is always in the lowest priority. Money is the highest priority. Wealth is the highest priority. They will go after. What is doing it? Satan is the one who's driving us to go after money, to give up the Lord. And this is truth. There are not many people who will give up for wealth and money and choose God. Now, who is doing it? Satan is the one who's doing this. This is what Satan had done in the past, and this is what the Satan is doing today, and this is what this is what the Satan will continue to do to draw everyone's heart and their attention. Now you understand why the stories in the Old Testament that shows the golden calf and golden ox? The stories in the Bible and who was behind it. Yet, of course, the Aaron did it. Yes, of course, the Jeroboam did. But behind Aaron and behind the Jeroboam, who was driving this? It's a Satan is the one who's driving this. Why? Because... He was the fallen cherub, and that is his image. Does that make sense? All right, let's coming back to Ezekiel again. Chapter 1. When you look at verse 11, such were their faces and their wings were spread out above. So their two wings are spread out above and each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wings of another. So they're spreading out their wings, two of them, while two cover their bodies. So the two wings, they're spreading out, they they're, look like they're flying. And the other two wings, since the cherub had four wings, two wings are hiding their body. It sounds like they're hiding their body. They're hiding 
bodies and their flying. And verse 12, and each went straight forward. Whichever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. This is one thing that we need to keep in mind. What does cherubs do? They go straight. They go straight and what? Wherever the spirit would go. Now, where do we go straight? Where do you go straight? We go straight based on where my flesh goes. Not my spirit goes. Right? We follow our bodily desire. Our flesh desire. That's where it draws us. We go after our desire of our flesh rather than a desire of our spirit. But the cherub, they go straight wherever their spirit goes. This is the difference between the cherub and us. Cherub follows their spirit. We follow our flesh. Because we follow our desire of flesh, we go wrong way. If we can follow the way that our spirit is going, we'll stay with the Lord. But we tend to follow our bodily desire more than a desire of our spirit. I wish, I wish I can be like Cherub that I always go straight wherever my spirit goes. I wish. Verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like appearance of a torches moving to and fro among the living creature, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creature darted to and fro like the appearance of a flashing of lightning. So it seems like the you know where the chirp is, there's a lots of lightnings, right? There's like torches. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a will on the earth besides the living creature, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheel and their constructions, their appearance was like a gleaming of a barrel, and four had the same likeness of their appearance and constructions being as it were a wheel within a wheel. A little weird. When they went, they went in and of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome. And the rims of a four were full of eyes all, all around. It's scare, right? And when the living creature went and will went besides them. And when the living creature rose from the earth, the will rose. What, wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went. This is exactly what I just said. Wherever, whenever their spirit would go, everything follows. And the wheel rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the will. The dear spirit is in the will. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those rose from the earth, and will rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheel. Over the heads of the living creature there was the likeness of an expense, shining like awe, inspiring crystal spread out above their heads, and under the expense their wings were stretched out straight, one towards another, and each creature had two wings covering uh, its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings, 
And there came a voice from above and expense over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expense over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had、uh, the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were a gleaming metal, like the appearance of a fire and cloth all around. And downward from the what had the appearance of his waist, I saw it as were the appearance of a fire. And there was a brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Now, it seems like the cherubim. Is around the throne of God, but where they actually situated, where they are, is they're surround the, the, the throne, but they're below the throne. The throne is above them. So you can imagine the cherubim at the bottom, and there's expense, and there's a throne above. Throne. Is in the center of the cherubim. So the cherubim is surrounding that throne, but they're below the throne. And they, this Ezekiel has seen something interesting. This is something he has seen in the vision, right? But there is a one person who has not seen this. But described exactly what the Ezekiel had seen. Do you know who that is? There is a person in the Bible who hasn't seen this vision, but described exactly what the Ezekiel is describing. Let's take a look at 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 19. Second Kings chapter 19, we're going to read from verse 14 and on. Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, And thrown above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Hezekiah never seen the vision like Ezekiel, but he described exactly the same thing what the Ezekiel is describing. Once again, Hezekiah, Ezekiel, same name. Right? Hezekiah is just ends with Yah. Ezekiel ends with El. That's the only difference. But it's the same exact name. They both h a s a scene that God's throne is above the cherub and the cherub is below them and surrounding the throne. This is amazing. The Hezekiah has never seen this, but he's describing exactly the way the Ezekiel has a scene. There's another person who has seen the same vision that the Ezekiel has seen in the Bible. Besides Hezekiah, who else in the Bible has seen exactly the same thing? John. Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. When you describe,、uh, when John describes this heavenly、uh, 
throne, he described this particular worship in heaven. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At, throne, at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne, and he sat, he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had appearance of emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the throne were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garment, with golden crown on their heads from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunders and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire which are the seven spirit of god and before the throne there was it were a sea of glass like crystal and around the throne on each side of the throne the four living creature full of eyes in front and behind the living creature like a lion and second living creature like an ox and third living creature with the face of a man and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight and four living creature each of them with six wings and full of eyes all around and within and day and night they were they, they uh, never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creature gives glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. Now, John has seen the almost the same identical vision that Ezekiel has seen. That cherub is around the throne along with the 24 elders. So, there are a few people in the Bible who has a scene in the vision, and Hezekiah did not see in the vision, but he described exactly the same the way as he has a scene, the Ezekiel has seen. And, coming back to Ezekiel, when you look at it from Verse 24, And when they went, I heard a sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of Almighty, a sound of a trump, uh, tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. So they let down their wings, and there came a voice, and from above the expanse over their heads, so above the, th uh, the, the cherub, when they stood still, they let down their wings. So because they're, they're letting down their hands, and above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne an, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with the human appearance, which is exactly the same things that John has a seen. But the question is this. What did Ezekiel has a seen? He has a seen the throne. But what did he see? He said. Seated above the likeness of a throne. Was a likeness. With the human appearance. Who would this be? The human the likeness of a human appearance at the throne. Who would this be? If this is not Jesus, who else could it be? So Ezekiel has seen the image of a man at the throne. And there is a glory all around it. He has a seen the glory. Now, verse 28 and on, like the appearance of a bow that is in the cloud and on the day of a rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When, and when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. Who is speaking? 
the one at the throne, one who has the appearance of a human, which is, we can think of, we could imagine, this is Jesus speaking. So, with this, I want to actually just wrap up today's lessons. So at least today, I described the details of Chirup and who they are, what they do, and how they are different from the rest of the spiritual being and where this evil came from.